the foundation of um, social justice and racial justice advocacy has always been um, within the black church. I, I, I often think about uh, Dr. King or the Children's March of Montgomery, Alabama, where I remember there was a woman who said, uh, my mom told me not to go to the protest, but I told her I was going to the church. But the protests begin at the church. <laughs> um, and so I, I do, mm -hmm. you know, I, I think what we kind of see today is a seeking and a, a desire for, you know, some form of equality. Um, however, Jesus, um, faith, being Christ-like is, is sort of being pushed out of those spaces, what I see when it comes to young people, or they don't see how it can intersect. All right, we're here to have some critical conversations that pertain to the church, uh, especially with young people or the next generation in mind. My name is Ray Chang, and I serve as the executive director of the 10 by 10 Collaboration, which is a youth discipleship initiative seeking to make faith matter more for 10 million young people over the course of the next 10 years. I'm also uh, the president of the Asian American Christian Collaborative, which seeks to uh, educate, equip, and empower Asian American Christians and friends of our community. I'm thrilled to be with many of my esteemed colleagues, brothers and sisters in Christ, uh, who are here to have this conversation with me. But could you each please uh, introduce yourselves? Maybe we'll start with you, Trine. My name is Trine McGee. I'm a Connecticut State Representative. I represent the 116th, which is West Haven, Connecticut. Justin Gibney. I'm the president of the Ann Campaign, which is a civic um, organization, Christian Civic Organization. I'm Gabby Kudja Wilkes. I'm a pastor in Brooklyn of the Double Love Experience Church. I'm Otis Moss. I serve as a pastor at Trinity United Church of Christ in Chicago, Illinois. I just feel the weight of all the insight and wisdom already flowing out of your mouths. So we're here to talk about uh, social justice and uh, Christian public engagement on the issue. Uh, let's start with a question. What does the Bible have to say about justice? Uh, I know anyone can answer whatever question uh, they'd like to. Yeah, I would say that I think the Bible gives us an imperative. Do justice. I mean, you can look at the, the Bible's definition of love in 1 John 3 to see that it's self-sacrificial. Uh, that words sometimes and sentiments are not enough and that we actually need to do and sacrifice for others. And I think that's where it begins. I think I think that pretty much hit the nail on the head, right? <laughs> okay. <Yeah. laughs> you laid it out very that, well. That was good. That's good. <laughs> Answered it for all of us. Well, the, Help us understand the, the, the tension between the biblical mandate of justice and why social justice seems to be so frowned upon in Christian circles these days. You know, American Christian circles, you have a very kind of westernized view of, of, of justice, of what justice should be. And so there is the dichotomy, the Sunday, and then there's what's happened from Monday through Saturday. And that's been the function of, of, of American Christianity. Uh, that what I do spiritually is completely separate from what I do with, in the rest of the world. And so that, that evangelical, white evangelical framework has really much shaped the way that many American churches have viewed justice. I have to keep it separate. I can't engage with it. So you get a partial gospel. Uh, you get a amputated Jesus in the process that doesn't do the work. And amongst uh, millennials and Gen Z, what I see is with the shifting of social justice in terms of media, um, there is no room for Jesus. There is no room for faith. The foundation of um, social justice and racial justice advocacy has always been um, within the black church. I, I, I often think about uh, Dr. King or the Children's March of Montgomery, Alabama, where I remember there was a woman who said, uh, my mom told me not to go to the protest, but I told her I was going to the church. But the protests begin at the church. Um, and so <laughs> I, I do, mm -hmm. you know, I, I think what we kind of see today is a seeking and a, a desire for, you know, some form of equality. Um, however, Jesus, um, faith, being Christ-like is, is sort of being pushed out of those spaces, what I see when it comes to young people, or they don't see how it can intersect. Yeah. Because I think there's been a project 
um, to try to only present a very meek Jesus, a Jesus that doesn't want to disrupt a Jesus of the status quo. And so when you've been in church and that's what you're hearing Sunday after Sunday from the pulpit, then you feel like if you're being disruptive or if you're going against a particular system or structure, that you're somehow not like Jesus and nothing could be farther from the truth. And so often when I sit in these conversations, I go right to Luke chapter four and 18, which is really the mission statement of why Jesus is here. And Jesus comes um, for the purpose of liberation, it comes for the purpose of, of healing and releasing captives and, 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 and writing debts away and, and freeing people. And so when I think uh, people are uncomfortable, when folks say they're uncomfortable about Jesus and justice, I think it's because they've probably been taught about a version of Jesus that is not the dominant version that we see um, in the gospels. And if they were to be reintroduced to Jesus, I think they would feel that connectivity again and feel more empowered. A lot of times people say, well, I wish the church would still protest. And I always push back, so I'm based in New York. And I'm always like, well, the church is there. Cause when I'm outside, I see all these folks who I know are members of churches. I see clergy, but we may not be wearing t-shirts that say I am the church. Clergy may no longer wear collars that distinguish themselves and so sometimes people don't know that the church really is out there as the people of God um, and I think we can do a better job of, of, of talking about the fact that the church is the people and the people are there and I think one thing that young people need to know too is some people don't want to talk about social justice because it's against their self-interest exactly. and so when when that comes that hammer comes down they may be losing something and I think Christians have to always be willing to lose something for the sake of justice. And white supremacy has the, the greatest marketing tools available of sharing that this is what we think the faith should be. And we're not going to move ourselves or destroy the faith that keeps us in power. So they will promote this idea that Jesus and justice don't go together. And that's why the black narrative is so powerful because it disrupts all of these ideas that are promoted at the top, something else comes from underneath. Great answers and great insights. Um, yeah, uh, let's press in a little bit deeper. So then what, if we're applying that to this day, this moment, the realities that we're seeing, I mean, one of the things that we um, are noticing is that a million young people are walking away from the faith. It's, it's, it's over a million young people walking away from the faith every single year. It's not just walking away from church, they're disaffiliating from their identity in Jesus. What are some of the reasons that you're seeing this in light of our conversation, uh, that's leading to this, in light of our conversations around justice? Uh, and what are some of the biggest social justice issues that you feel like we need to be addressing more thoughtfully, uh, more courageously, more powerfully as the church? Yeah, I, I think what's so important as well as, even as we talk about politics, um, that a, mil a million uh, millennials have left their Democratic parties. Um, they're a specific uh, political party, mainly the Democratic party. 45% uh, of non-white kids attending a university in New York City registered as um, independent for the first time in history. And so I sort of see a compound of two very important things that I care about, um, God, ministry, and the political space and policy and how young people, the reaction is the same. And I, I think we've created constructs around, we don't talk about religion, we don't talk about politics. And so then we sort of create this narrative that young people are running away from these things or detaching because they're just not interested. I thought it was so, um, cool to see a statistic that said that 86% of young people would come to church if they were invited. Um, and especially by, a, it was specific, it said, especially by a mentor. And so as we look at this generation, the question that they ask is, what is beautiful? Which is much different than any other generational question. And so I think a large part of uh, what we've done is we haven't engaged in difficult conversations with them and or allowed them to express some of their difficulties with maybe the church or even with the political space, um, you know, which has caused them to say, OK, well, then maybe this isn't for me at all. Um, and it sort of leads into, you know, wh what I believe is really important for this time. We have to talk about climate change. It is just very deeply important to uh, Gen Z, um, carbon gases um, and uh, sea life, um, aquaculture, agriculture. Those they're, they're very important. Fifty six percent of um, Gen Z would support a cause if they knew that their money was going to something that was benefiting the climate. 
Um, the second issue I think is really important is black maternal health and infant mortality. Yes. Um, a, a million millennials are becoming moms every year. Um, and we're, we're, I mean, just, just off the basis of not being believed within the medical industry. Um, and so those are two very important things that I think we can sort of lead as the body of Christ and engaging in with young people to show that we are knowledgeable, we're reading, we're informative, and we do care about what impacts you. I, I love that. I, I would add um, an issue that I'm really concerned about that I think we're seeing in real time um, is this idea of how are we going to tell the story of black people in this nation. And so we're at a time period now where many of the folks who lived through the civil rights era are getting to their 80s, their 90s, um, their hundreds and passing away. So what happens when we have a time period where no one who lived through that time period is still alive to correct the rewriting of history that is actively happening in our school curriculums, it's actively happening in our churches, actively happening in our communities. It's quite possible that 30 years from now, none of, no one who lived through these time periods is still alive. And then the narrative that um, generations behind us have is one that's been newly constructed after that generation has died off. And so I'm not a historian by trade, but I'm very concerned about our history and the stories that are going to live beyond those who have lived experience to correct um, any fallacies or any propaganda that has been created to keep um, certain demographics from feeling guilty about what their foreparents have done or from feeling uncomfortable. I think we need discomfort to help us recognize how far we've come. And if not, history will repeat itself. And what's fascinating about what both of you all stated is that if you look at post-Reconstruction period, along with SNCC and the Black Panther Party, that you see young people during those time periods raising the exact same questions that they're raising today that I don't see faith being able to fit into the movement of how do we create a flourishing, thriving black community because of the quote unquote white supremacist framework of faith that I encountered. Same thing was raised with, with SNCC. Same thing was raised with the Black Panther Party. But what's interesting is that each generation says, I have an issue with the institution, but I understand the power of spirituality, that, that I wanna be invited uh, I want to see a flourishing, nurturing, liberating faith tradition function in my lifetime. How can we imagine that? Yeah. Well, that's good. I think some other issues that are important along with what has already been said is I think we have to look at wages and the way that our wages have been pushed down and it leaves people very dependent in ways that they shouldn't be because they're working very hard. They're just not getting paid for it. Uh, the other thing I would say is housing especially in some of our urban uh, locations, housing is almost impossible. You have these big cities and people can't live in them almost in, unless they're living on the street. Uh, the other day, the Ann campaign had to deal with rats bursting through the walls where people have kids and they have to live in these spaces where the rats are big enough to break out of the, uh, out of the traps. And so we have to sit back and say, not even on a partisan basis, but are we treating people and are they, uh, provided with the standard of living that is humane. And housing is a big issue because you have these big companies going up and buying whole neighborhoods and creating a culture where nobody can buy a house. And so they're, you know, they're basically moving um, all the time and just, it's just a cycle of moving and you can't have community and a lot of other things and peace of mind when you're doing that. That's good. I mean, so essentially you're saying, all of you are saying that we need to seek the welfare of our neighbors and the cities that we're living in, our societies, that's in the Bible, in Jeremiah, that we're also called to, to bear witness and to be a light to the world. Now, you, th these are some big topics, big issues. How are you seeing these things affect young people in the, po in, in the pews that, you're, uh, that, you, that, 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 that are, that are in, the, in the churches that you're, you're in? So one of the things that I briefly uh, previously mentioned was agriculture. And when you're looking at a community of migrants who are coming from their native lands, at the root and core of their labor work is agriculture. And so I didn't connect, uh, you know, the climate or the importance of the climate or the desire to say, we need to figure out how we're, we're gonna maintain a healthy grass field until I sat down with young people whose parents, um, you know, pick strawberries and, um, you know, um, raised all sorts of animals, 
you know, to f feed and provide for the community. And that's when I realized, okay, this is something that we, we have to address and also see as an important issue. Um, and then also, I think with, with rewriting history and, and sort of talking about uh, that, is um, as a theater teacher, I, uh, I do a lot of a social, social emotional learning and engaging with kids. And the goal is to, it's not so much for a social view as much as it is to teach children how to regulate their emotions. And I think when kids are given true resources, authentic quality resources, they're able to not only uh, grow and expand, but then to take what they learned to, and to share with others. And, and that's sort of what I see in building community is being able to really engage young people, engage youth ministry. There's a lot of creative arts ministries, um, the prophetic and sacred arts rising up. Um, the, I have to shout out the Black Voices Movement, the Young Black Missionaries out of California. There's so many groups rising up and they're, they're meeting the needs of their communities and here and even abroad. Um, but it all began with their churches addressing some of the issues that they saw was important and creating a space for dialogue. It's local first becomes global. Uh, we've witnessed in, in Chicago a powerful movement in and around the creation of gardens in the community. And by creating small spaces, you end up changing what we know as violence in the community. Why? Because you create community in the process. When you take over a vacant lot, whether the city gives it to you or not, you just take over it, and something happens in that neighborhood. And young people have been the impetus behind this movement of taking over these lots and planting something new. And then all of a sudden, elders and young people are working together. Then they're starting to create this idea of what is the policy necessary to change the community? Then what is the effect, the heat effect as a result of taking over this particular field and how does it change our community? So, so there's all this connection around the idea of creation and then also social justice and organizing. And we're seeing groups of young people take hold of this because they first have an encounter with this idea in churches, as you mentioned, uh, that are speaking about these pertinent issues? Um, what I have seen, uh, my church uh, started just before the pandemic. So m many of the people who are connected to us are digitally connected first. We may meet them physically later, but digital is usually the way. And what I have seen, interestingly enough, to my point about writing history and rewriting history, I've seen young people get on TikTok and recover the truth, the true origin of something they did not know. And they'll sit in front of their camera and they'll say, did y'all know that we thought it was this, but it's actually this? And I can't tell you how many times I've been in conversations with folks, I'm a millennial, with Gen Zers and Generation Alpha, and they will literally be like, you ain't know that, Pastor Gabby? I found out on TikTok. And they're dead serious. It's like, it's not a joke. Like, they're literally like, yeah, TikTok taught me that. I right. learned everything on TikTok. And if, if you don't really understand what they mean by that, it will sound trivial. But what's actually happening is really a reclamation project mm. um, on our social media where young people are going and get doing their own research because they can't trust what they're being taught in the schools and sometimes in our churches and then they are actually experiencing a kind of co-learning lab of sorts online um, and you know it happened years ago on, on Twitter I think it's now moved from Twitter to more of these kind of visual conversations um, but I think there's really important um, space for folks to teach one another, a lot of peer learning that I think young people are doing better than we are, quite frankly, um, and really making things accessible to one another and, and peeling back um, the cover up that has been happening for so long. That's so good. And just to piggyback on a couple of things you said, uh, you know, we're, we're, you're talking about the, the, revision, the revising of history, the, the pushing of propaganda, the, the, the learning that's being done that wasn't tied to the education or formal education that we've received. Uh, through ACC, we hosted a, a Asian American civil, Christian civil rights trip. Uh, and one of the things that we revealed through that, uh, or that was discovered through that, was that uh, there was a deep sense of social activism and engagement in the Asian American Christian community. And there was a lot of cross-racial solidarity even among Christians with African American communities. So, for example, the, one, the oldest Japanese American church in the in the continental U.S. is in San Francisco, um, pastored by a friend of mine. And she, uh, as she was walking through the history of the church, we found out that Howard Thurman and his church mm -hmm. had occupied that 
church when they were incarcerated and interned. Mm -hmm. And the interaction and the engagement there was extremely profound. And there are countless stories like that that most people don't know, um, unless you're Otis Moss, right? <laughs> and so, uh, or on TikTok. <laughs> and so uh, what you're saying is, is, uh, is, is, is spot on. And, and I, I wanna wrap us up with one last question to, to kind of bring us home. What are Christians then called to do in light of all this, especially as it relates to the call of justice? What do you want to encourage Christians to do, church leaders, young people within churches to do? And it will end with that. Um, I'll hop in first. There is a quote that I'm not going to get precisely, um, but it pretty much says that we will remember more the silence of our friends um, than the harm of our adversaries when we're going through times of injustice. That is a paraphrase. Um, but I think that Christians are called to use our voices and use our platforms. Um, you do not have to be clergy to have a platform in order to respond to an act of injustice. And I think one of the biggest calls that we need to remind ourselves of is that we need to agitate ourselves a little bit um, and make ourselves inconvenienced towards the cause of any of these causes that we've raised for our neighbors um, so that if our neighbor is going through, at least they can't say we were silent and we didn't try. That's good. Something else I would say is just to be prepared to sacrifice for people you disagree with. Mm -hmm. I think the, the, the beauty of a kind of agape based social justice is that we don't have to necessarily agree, but I'm still not going to let people treat you a certain way. I'm still going to protect you. And I think too often we get into either partisanship, ideology, classism, and we only see those we want to see. We only feel bad for those we want to feel bad for. And I think we got to be able to see the humanity in everybody and be willing to protect everybody. And I'd say um, encourage young people who say they want to run for office. Um, God called me to politics. It was not anything I prayed for. It was not even anything I knew to pray for. I just wanted God to have his will in my life. Um, and coming from a background in the arts, I believe God is raising up in people in every different field, every different space who are bold and brave to stand righteously on, on the word in political office on both the Democratic and the Republican side. I, I truly believe that. And so if there's a young person who says I want to run for office, the day and age of stay away from politics and stay out of office and it's over. We need to figure out how we're going to mobilize political spaces. If young people are great with finances, encourage them to be campaign treasurers. If young people have graphic design vision, they might be the social media analyst person for a campaign. That's the direction I believe that we're also going in as well. And I think it was Bishop Jakes who said, like, we don't need any more. And I think you all would understand when I, what I say when I say, he was like, we don't need any more like preachers and teachers. And of course, there's going to always come. But he said, we need lawyers and doctors and artists and producers and dancers. We need to take back all seven mountains. And I, and I truly believe uh, God is, truly, is raising up courageous people in the political sphere. You know, we're, we're called to be an alternative, radical, revolutionary community committed to liberation that's rooted in love and justice. But the faith has been constricted as a capitalist community that is committed to making profits instead of being prophetic. And that is the call of, of the church when the church gets back to its early roots of being a community that was alternative, an alternative community to the Roman Empire. And we are now in the American Empire. And we should not be connected to the state, but always communicating to ensure that the empire is not the community that is in control, not the community that is harming people, but we have to be that voice that's always bearing witness in times like these to be bold and prophetic. Well, thank you so much for being with us. Appreciate all of the wonderful insights and looking forward to future conversations. Thank you. Thank you.